should be working. Just make sure. Yeah, it, yeah, it shows it, shows it on my end that it it's recording. It. Okay, good, yeah. Oh, there it is. All right, just popped up. I guess there's a little bit of a delay. Um, mm -hmm. okay, cool. So if anybody um, during the presentation, um, everybody is is on mute um, except for Scott and I, but if you have a question um, about anything that you're seeing here today or anything, you know, that, that just pops into your head that you're thinking about, um, there is a chat. Um, there is a chat bubble there at the top of your um, screen. Um, if you want to click on that and enter your question into the chat, um, that, that's going to be that I'm going to be moderating today. Um, and I will see your questions as they come in. My name is Erin, and I am uh, with the Humane Society of Hartford County. For those of you that don't know who I am, and let me go ahead and get my uh, my screen up here. All right. To present. All right. I hope everybody can see my screen. Um, so I really would like to welcome uh, Scott McDaniel from Susquehannock Wildlife Society today. We're really excited to have him back. Scott was a, a presenter last year and uh, we were not we we were not recording last year, so this this year we are recording this and we'll have this um, for posterity for playback. So we're really excited about that. Um, so we're going to get to Scott in just a minute. Um, so my name's Erin. I'm the uh, marketing coordinator here at the Humane Society, and uh, let me tell you just real quickly a little bit about this shelter in case you don't know exactly who we are. Um, we were established in uh, 1946 by Elsa Voss, um, and we're celebrating our 76th anniversary this year. So yay for happy birthday to us. We're really excited. Um, and uh, so yeah, our mission, you can see that there. Um, and we take in anywhere from about 2,500 to 3,000 animals here at the shelter every year. Um, obviously cats and dogs, but in addition to that, all kinds of small and free animals. Um, we take in reptiles, farm animals, so we never know what we're going to get. Okay. Sounds like we have a background. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we've been in the same location here on Connolly Road since our founding in 1946, um, and our new uh, 19,000, well, it's not so new anymore, but our 19,000 square foot shelter opened in 2016, and, uh, and we're loving it here in this new space. Um, and we are a private uh, nonprofit organization, and we do have a contract with Hartford County government. So um, we are the sheltering operation for the county. So any animals that they're picking up as strays or that they're having to seize, they all come here and uh, we provide uh, the care and, uh, and any uh, medical needs that they have. Um, so we are private. We're not affiliated with any of the large national groups, so we're not part of Humane Society of the United States or the ASPCA or anything like that. So we do rely on uh, support and donations from the community, um, as does uh, Susquehannock Wildlife Society. Um, so we we do you know appreciate any donation that we can get. Um, we get a, a we have a. a 1.4 million annual operating budget. We do have a contract with Hartford County. Um, so we get um, nearly uh, like nearly a million dollars from Hartford County um, and the rest uh, we get from uh, fundraising and uh, service fees and uh, any restitution that we're able to get um, from any uh, legal proceedings that we're a part of. So just really, you know, briefly about what we do. Here's some of our staff and some of the animals that have passed through the shelter um, recently over, you know, over the last year or two. Um, but yeah, we promote animal adoption as the first option, um, obviously. And, um, you know, with taking in, Jen's got uh, this slide that, that here's that she created. She says about 3,000 to 3,500 animals. I think last year our intake was actually down. Um, so it was about 2,500 last year, which is, um, which is great. Um, we provide shelter intervention counseling here at the shelter, as well as community resources to prevent any kind of surrenders um, from coming in. Um, you know, 
the animal's best place is at home with its family. So if we can prevent, you know, an animal from being surrendered and, and provide resources so that it can stay in the home, um, you know, our mission is accomplished. Um, we also uh, have a lost and found program here at the shelter. Um, and uh, we do work to reunite lost pets with the owners. We're always, always doing that. We have a food pantry here for people that are having trouble um, making ends meet and maybe they just need a couple bags of food to get them through. Um, so we do provide that. Um, we have uh, uh, pet training classes here. We partner with Mutt Magic Training. And um, so you can take an eight week course here at the shelter with your dog. Um, or she also provides, uh, the trainer Asia also provides uh, free behavioral consultations. I believe it's on the second and fourth uh, Saturdays of every month, but there is more information on our website um, at hartfordshelter.org. Um, so, see so um we do provide you know outreach in the community we're always going out and, and doing things in the community um and you know we have our literature and our merchandise and we just love to talk to people and help educate them about what we do and answer their pet questions um um, so yeah, just a little bit about our relationship, um, you know, with animal control, we are two separate entities. Um, animal control's job is to enforce the laws of Hartford County. So they are going out and, you know, they're educating pet owners. They are picking up strays that are found in the community. Um, and then they all sometimes are going out and, um, you know, they're having to seize animals from less than desirable living situations. Um, and then our job then is to provide the care um, here at the shelter. Um, we're also the holding facility if there are any criminal cases that have to you know, play out in court. Um, we're present at trial um, to advocate for the animal, um, as that says, and also for our organization um, and, and kind of trying to recoup some of those fees um, if we can when, when cases go to trial. Um, we also do um, provide humane euthanasia here at the shelter um, for animals that, um, you know, maybe require rabies testing or are um, severely injured or ill. Um, and uh, there's, you know, we, we just can't help them. Um, we do everything we can, but sometimes there are those cases. Um, so we do not pick up, uh, you know, any stray pets or anything like that. That's all of our, our wonderful partners with uh, the sheriff's office and animal control. So, um, yeah, there's a little bit about um, how to um, always be notified of what's going on here at the shelter. We have a monthly e-newsletter. Um, we have these monthly um, virtual lunch and learns. Um, so always check out HartfordShelter.org to see what's going on. All right. So at this point, let me, um, Scott, I want to... Uh, Right. So hopefully my screen's turned off, but I want to introduce um, Scott McDaniel, um, read a little bit about him that I got off of the website, which is really interesting. Um, so Scott grew up in Carroll County, and uh, he said that as a child, he loved to play in streams, looking for reptiles and amphibians, and he had a particular obsession with turtles. Um, and he loved to read uh, books and also watching nature shows like Wild America. Um, Scott is an Eagle Scout and he also graduated from Towson University. He has a Bachelor of Science in Electronic Media and Film, which is interesting. Um, so in uh, 2011, Scott helped to co-found Susquehannock Wildlife Society and he's now the executive director. And so that means that he can work full time um, at the Wildlife Center and he's also helping to build a successful future for the organization. So without further ado, Scott, take it away. Hello, uh, are you able to see my uh, PowerPoint? Yes. Okay, great. Um, thanks to everyone for joining us um, today and uh, those who will watch later. Um, uh, you can always reach out to us uh, if you have further questions after this meeting um, about any events or if you have uh, rescue needs, things like that, or just wildlife questions in general. Um, you can contact us through social media. Um, we'll have our phone number uh, at the end, our email address as well. So please reach out. Um, we're here to serve the community of kind of all things wildlife related, um, and, and we'll get into that a little bit more as we go. But um, yeah, I'm glad to be here and, and working in partnership with Humane Society. We um, we have very um, 
similar missions in a lot of ways. You know, we're trying to speak for uh, animals that can't speak for themselves oftentimes and um, just try to help the public consider animals and wildlife, um, you know, as we do all, a lot of things um, in our daily lives. Um, so I think it's very important that they also get representation and, and have, um, you know, advocates out there to, um, to help out because animals, you know, are, a lot of them are struggling in, in, the, in the human world um, that we all live in. So um, let me get a little bit into our organization. So um, we're also a 501c3 nonprofit. And our focus is a little different than um, some of the other uh, environmental groups in, in Maryland, mainly because our focus is almost solely on the Susquehanna River Basin and the surrounding areas. So really Hartford, Cecil County, um, kind of the habitats extend into York and Lancaster County, just that whole lower Susquehanna region. And then, you know, we kind of cover all of Hartford County because this is where we are based out of. But we're, we try to kind of capture that kind of coastal, freshwater coastal area to the Piedmont that's found here in Hartford County and Cecil County, uh, compared to a lot of groups that focus on Chesapeake Bay, which needs a lot of help and needs a lot of ag advocacy. But we wanted to kind of uh, separate ourselves out from all the great work being done for the Bay itself and really focus on the Susquehanna area, which we feel like doesn't really get a lot of attention as it might deserve because you know, it's this longest non-navigable river um, you know, on the east. And, and it's kind of a lot of us just pass over it on 95 and look down, but a lot of people don't get to know it that well. They don't get to, to paddle it, to understand the ecosystems that surround it, all the really special wildlife that calls it home. So that's kind of our focus. And you know, we formed in 2011, so we just had our 10th anniversary last year and we've grown quite a bit since then. Um, and, and kind of our, our, our threefold, and really it's four because it kind of combines, but as a research, education, and rescue, um, which all kind of leads into conservation. So conservation is our big push because, you know, protecting these um, habitats and, and wildlife that calls them um, home that uh, yeah, really is, is critical to the future of, of people enjoying wildlife in our area and, and having a healthy uh, ecosystem. So the first part is rescue. So, you know, rescue is one of the things that really helped us um, start from the very beginning, which was, you know, people would say, hey, who do you call, you know, if there's a wildlife issue? Um, and, and we'll go into that. There are, there are many people you can call. Um, some are able to respond, some aren't. And, and we try to act as a, either a go-between or just a source of information to help people connect with the right places to go if you have in your wildlife or what to do, and, and honestly, most of the time, it's what not to do um, that we'll talk about a good bit today. Um, conservation, you know, we have some focal species that we really uh, like to like to uh, highlight. Um, you know, the Baltimore checker spot butterflies are state insect. We're working to restore them at our wildlife center and, and trying to figure out if they are sustainable and able to be restored in our area. Um, the Eastern Hellbender is a two foot long salamander that um, it, as far as anyone could tell is no longer found in the lower Susquehanna. Um, the Maryland darter is a species of fish found nowhere else in the whole world except for Hartford County. Hasn't been seen since the late 80s. And then we focus um, a good bit on some rare turtles that are still found in Hartford County area and Cecil County. Um, and then some other mammals that are just kind of interesting or that we, we put out trail cameras trying to find or that we observe. Um, and then species like barn owls that just have uh, almost disappeared from this area of the state. Um, and, and looking at measures that might potentially be able to restore them down the road if um, habitat uh, is, is sometime, at some point restored. Um, and then education, of course, is really the, the kind of the foundation for everything because, you know, a lot of people have, uh, you know, been told misinformation on wildlife, you know, about touching baby birds, for instance, that it'll scare the mothers away, that sort of thing. And uh, what to do in certain situations, which species are dangerous and might not be, and, and how to properly do something. A lot of us have been told the wrong thing for many years. So we're trying to kind of, you know, go back and, and set the record straight on some of these things, as well as just highlighting species that people might, you know, not have um, even considered that are part of our ecosystem because they don't see them because maybe they come out at night. Maybe they only breed for a couple weeks a year, something like that. And then uh, research, we actually do hands-on research. We don't just rely on the research done by others, although we do a lot of that. Um, we actually go out and we'll collect data 
We've published uh, several papers on various uh, species, mostly reptiles and amphibians um, in, that we've researched in the county. Some are ongoing, like our wood turtle uh, project. Some we've completed, like our copperhead behavioral study um, to determine the likelihood of a copperhead striking uh, in various situations that a hiker might encounter a copperhead. Um, and then eDNA testing, which was um, uh, searching for the DNA of, of these hellbenders uh, in our creeks to see if they, in fact, could still be surviving in, in some area. Um, our results on that, uh, so far from uh, the years we did the study was, we had all negative um, tests come back um, and none have been seen for some decades. So a lot of this kind of culminates um, to the effort of uh, building a, a wildlife center in Hartford County. Um, we have some absolutely wonderful nature centers in Hartford County, um, Anita Light, uh, Eden Mill, uh, for instance, and then we have many parks owned by the, the county and by the state, um, some private, some the Hartford Land Trust owns some really incredible properties. Um, but we wanted to do something a little different in that having a center that was focused strictly on uh, wildlife, um, not so much about pollution or watersheds and things like that, but really, um, you know, hone it in on wildlife and have um, live animals there for folks to see. Uh, museum great exhibits that they could see that would um, highlight our local species and ecosystems, um, as well as focus on our rescue operations and our research. We actually have a laboratory that we're building that we built there, and, um, and among other things. Um, our property is uh, in Darlington, and it is not open to the public yet. However, we do have special events where we invite uh, the public to come out and see the property as it is now, and. Um, we're hoping to open uh, by the end of the year, beginning of next year, after um, many setbacks uh, as the pandemic had, has affected many, uh, many organizations. Ours is um, one of those as well, of course, um, but things just being slowed down and things taking longer, but, um, and then of course funding. But we are, we're working hard to complete all of what we started there and, and see our vision becomes a reality. So um, the state actually owns this property, it's 20 acres of Trap Church Road. And we've been working to, to kind of redesign this parcel of land that was formerly a farm to incorporate native plants, things like snake dens um, that we've built, a native fruit orchard with pawpaws and persimmon trees, um, outdoor a green bathroom, uh, a classroom we're building out of our barn and in our building, um, amphibian breeding areas, wildlife nest boxes, and um, kind of our pride and joy as a, as a um, eight acres of wildflower meadow in an old pasture um, where we actually have, um, you know, pollinator habitat um, that we that we've actually planted there and, and we're trying to maintain grasslands that are incredibly important and rare uh, habitat in this area. Uh, this is a little bit of a rendition of what this, the inside of the center is going to look similar to. So some kind of realistic uh, habitat elements so you can kind of visualize the, the habitat for these different species. Uh, that are kind of found in this area. So moving on, um, you know, one of the big focuses for today, um, since a lot of you um, are interested in kind of animals in general, and, and we wanted to talk about uh, wildlife rescue and what to do, what not to do that you could share with your friends. We get in a lot of calls right now, um, messages constantly about things that people are finding because they're working around their homes. They're finding animals stranded on roads. Um, they're finding things at work. So we try to help with those calls, but you know, a lot of this uh, goes back to education. So people understanding what to do and what not to do uh, in these situations. So just to be very clear again, uh, our organization does not do rehabilitation. We do not do the medical work um, for uh, these animals that, that are injured or orphaned. We don't do any of the care giving for these animals, but we will help with rescue, meaning um, we'll actually go capture an animal that is uh, orphaned or injured sometimes, um, but many times we're just advising the public on, you know, how to, you know, box it up and take it to where it needs to go because we'll just end up acting as kind of the middle ground uh, since we don't do any of the actual uh, caregiving for the animals. Um, I just kind of went over this. So, um, but what we're really trying to do is create a larger network of people that can help. Uh, you know, a lot of these. Um, Community like Facebook groups and things like that. A lot of people ask, hey, I found baby bunnies. What do I do? I found a baby bird. What do I do? So the more people out there that can kind of give feedback and tell them where to go or what to do or say, hey, that's just a fledging, leave it alone. Um, that sort of thing we'll get into here. 
So here's how our system works. Um, so you know we have this hotline that um, folks can call, and, um, and and we always try to answer, get back to folks. So they leave a message and they call us. Um, that's something that we really strive for, even as a small organization with just one employee. Um, we definitely try to keep up on those calls because a lot of people are, you know, in desperate need of help. And they're calling around, and you know, a lot of our our partners, you know, they're busy taking care of animals around the clock. So if we can help, at least answer the phone and kind of direct them to the right place they need to go, that can save a lot of time um, for our partners and just help the animal get to the care it needs as quickly as possible. So um, a lot of times, you know, probably 90% of the time, we're just providing advice um, or telling them where to go. And then every once in a while, we go out and actually capture an animal and, and help out um, transporting it to a licensed um, vet or, or rehabilitator. So I mean, this has come up quite a bit, and I always like to touch on it because um, you know a lot of these species are protected. You can't just have a pet raccoon in Maryland. You can't. Um, you're not supposed to have a bald eagle feather, for instance. You're not supposed to touch, uh, you know, a great horned owl. These are protected animals uh, by law, and many times federal law uh, protects uh, migratory bird species. But there's an exemption in that law, and it's kind of a good Samaritan type of um, exemption. Um, now, if the animal is in need of help, it's injured, it's orphaned, you can transport it, you can possess it um, in your vehicle or in your home for the time period required to get it to where it needs to go to be helped. A lot of times these places are closed by the time you find the animal. You're allowed, you know, we always say contact an organization so they know you have it so that you're then covered under their permit and then um, get it to where it needs to go as quickly as possible. Now, if you're keeping the animal in your house for a week um, and trying to take care of it on your own, that's actually, obviously, that's a, against the law, and that's something that uh, should not occur. Um, it does sometimes, unfortunately, and we have to advise people, you know, it's, it's illegal to rehabilitate wildlife um, without a permit, a license. Um, so it needs to really be done by the professionals um, because, um, you know, there's a lot of specialized care. And even though we have the internet at our disposal, it's often and usually wrong in how to do so. So I really need to leave it up to the professionals on how to properly um, take care of uh, these animals. Um, so here's some of the most common things that we get um, that we're going to go through real quick. So um, a lot of times birds, um, you know, um, are injured. So, um, you know, we'll get animals that, that are, um, you know, laying on the ground, kind of falling over like this hawk that I'm showing in this picture. Um, you know, that it was acting abnormally, it was kind of falling over, it wasn't a fledgling, so we knew it needed to have care. Um, it was sick, um, or it hit a window, or we're not really sure. Um, we also have uh, things like, you know, baby birds in a nest, um, the nest is in a bad spot, uh, the nest fell out of a tree, that sort of thing. Um, so um, what happens a lot of times is we're just telling people, you know, hey, you find a baby bird fell out of a nest, you can put it back in the nest, and it doesn't have all of its feathers like the ones in the pictures here. Um, you can place them back in the nest. Um, the mother birds are not deterred by your scent, as many people have been told throughout their lives. Uh, it's actually not true. Um, but you know, anytime you're handling any wildlife, we always recommend wearing gloves whenever possible um, because uh, you know disease and things like that. Always wash your hands whenever you're touching any wildlife species. Um, but you know, putting baby birds back in a nest, and then if you can't find the nest. Um, we do often tell people, you know, to put the babies into like a, a basket, like a wicker basket and hang it from a nearby tree or shrub where it's off the ground away from predators, but the mother can continue to care for it. Um, you know, it just depends on the situation, but you can always call us and we can step you through it. Um, waterfowl, as far as um, birds go, a lot more difficult. We get a lot of calls for injured geese. A lot of times if they have a broken foot, but they can fly, there's nothing we can do. We can't get close enough. They fly away. We can't capture flying birds um, that are able to fly, but if they have a broken wing, something like that, we try to help. Um, we often rescue birds that have fishing lines stuck around them. Um, sometimes they have lead poisoning. Um, some people shot them, all sorts of things. So, um, you know, just call us and we can help figure out the situation and go from there. Um, herons, we get a lot of calls for these. They're very lanky animals. They, um, they hang around ponds, they get stuck in fishing line. Um, they get hit by cars sometimes. Um, they get tangled in trees and litter, things like balloons, uh, strings, and things like that. But they can be very dangerous to handle. So just um, 
we always say, you know, watch your eyes. They have these long beaks. They could uh, injure your eyes pretty easily. So you have to control the head. Um, be very they have very delicate legs and things like that. So you have to be very careful with them. So I talked about this a little bit. Um, just a reminder of that um, uh, about the uh, touching baby birds. Um, here's a little bit we talked about the difference between fledglings and um, and uh, um, you know uh, younger birds that maybe need care. Once a bird is like hopping on the ground and it has all its feathers, it's typically a fledgling. We have a lot of calls for these right now because people are finding these birds laying on the ground and they're hopping around. They seem very helpless, um, but while they're on the ground, the mother continues to feed them. So as long as there's not an immediate threat to for you know. Um, pets like dogs in the backyard or something that's going to hurt these birds. Uh, we often say just leave them alone, let them hop around, they'll hang out on the shrub. The mother will continue to feed them. And then um, a couple days later to a week, they'll be flying on their own. They're just getting their wings strong. They're learning how to fly. Um, most of the times you don't need to intervene. A lot of people take them and they take them to a rehabilitator and the bird would have been totally fine. So raptors are ones that we often deal with. Um, they're typically a little more dangerous, so we tend to intervene more commonly when we have raptors that need help. Um, everything from bald eagles to vultures and hawks and ospreys. A lot of times their wings are broken, they get in fights, they get hit trees, power lines. Um, so they often need help um, when they are in those situations. Um, typically what we do, we just, you know, we carry around drop cloths and large blankets or um, towels and we we tend to throw them kind of over top of them so that we can kind of control them um, close their wings keep them safe and then put them into a carrier for transport um, vultures are the ones that <laughs> not everybody's favorite um, but uh, we've rescued a lot of them over the years people shoot them they get hit by cars try to feed on dead animals on the roads um, and recently at the kind of the dam there was many that were infected with the avian uh, influenza which was a pretty scary situation up there um, over 100 birds died. So situation like that, we, we would not be involved and we were not directly involved with that situation just because of the sensitivity and the, the threat of um, disease transmission with that situation. They had to hire a professional company to come in and handle those dead birds. But uh, with just generally injured vultures, I mean, they tend to throw up and um, defecate on you and things like that. But uh, they're really important animals and we've chased many of them through neighborhoods trying to capture them. They can run really fast even if they can't fly. So we've done that many times and that's that's a bird we always look out for being injured and, and try to give them a helping hand. So another really common one that we get is uh, raccoons. So um, I know the Humane Society gets a lot of calls for baby raccoons and um, because of the rabies uh, concern now, obviously most raccoons don't have rabies, but um, they can and they're one of the more common carriers of rabies. So, um, you know, all these animals must be handled with gloves uh, if they are to be handled, uh, even little cute baby ones. Um, if people are taking, you know, selfies with them, um, you know, uh, for social media and they're kissing them and hugging them, those uh, babies actually will have to be put down and tested for rabies. And the only way to do that is uh, to, to euthanize them, uh, to properly test them. Um, so do not touch them with bare skin. It's dangerous for you and the animals. So. We always tell people that ahead of time just so they know because it's an innocent mistake to make. They're very, very cute and they look like little kittens and we understand they're puppies. And, um, but you, know, you protect the animals and yourself in those situations. But um, many times mothers actually leave their babies while they're out hunting or they're trying not to attract predators to them. And when they get to a certain age, they start crawling around a good bit. So we like to tell people, you know, just because you see something doesn't mean it's orphaned. And a lot of people see babies without a mother, they just assume they're orphaned. So we usually let, leave them alone and then we tell people to observe them for a while to see if there actually is uh, a mother coming around um, for them before the, the, uh, they're taken away from their mother. We get a lot of raccoons stuck in trash cans and dumpsters. So one of the easiest things for that is just to put a, a board or a stick into the trash can or dumpster, let them crawl on their own so you don't have to handle them. Um, that's a pretty common call we get. Opossums are another one. So we get a lot of these guys. Um, unfortunately, most that opossums that people see are hit on the road. Um, we've had them in trash cans. Um, and a lot of times people find them um, dead on the road will actually still have babies in their pouches. We had one of those last week. Um, and people actually retrieved the babies from the, um, from the mother that was, that was killed by a car and took them to a rehabilitator, try to give them a shot. Um, uh, 
but um, these animals don't live a whole really long time. Uh, and, and people think that they're aggressive and they growl and things like that, but they, they're almost completely harmless. Um, they make a lot of noise, but they're, they're actually harmless. Um, you can see on this slide that uh, any baby measuring less than seven inches um, and is alone um, uh, might need help. If they're bigger, they're probably okay. Um, but if they fall off, uh, the mothers will often leave them. So it's you can find babies sometimes uh, that are orphaned and, um, and they might need help. So foxes are other ones. Um, we get sometimes their dens get flooded out. Um, sometimes the mothers get killed on roads quite commonly. We see a lot on the roads right now this time of year as they're out hunting. Um, so keep an eye out for them. They get um, they show up on under people's sheds a lot of times. We get a lot of calls of people trying to remove animals from their backyards. And sometimes we understand like you have pets or you don't want animals living under your shed. So a lot of people, what they will suggest is using pine saw or ammonia and putting it on like a tennis ball or a rag and like putting it under the shed. And that, that strong odor will um, usually have the animal leave the, the area safely uh, without hurting it, but it, it'll kind of clear out your shed um, without having to trap them. Because most times if you call a company to trap, animals like foxes, they're going to, they really can't take them anywhere besides, you know, right off your property. They can't take them to a, a beautiful park somewhere and release them because of disease transmission and just property rights. So, um, you know, if you decide to get animal trapped or moved from your property, just be aware it's probably going to get euthanized. So um, the best, the best uh, course of action is try to coexist with them, maybe just evict them from, you know, the part of your property they're hiding under, but, you know, let them, let them go roam freely out into the woods or wherever is nearby. Uh, I always just like to bring up that we have two species of foxes in this area. The gray fox is incredibly rare in Harford County. Um, for whatever reason, we're not really sure, but you can find a lot more in Western and Southern Maryland. And as further south you go, you tend to find more of them. But uh, yeah, we do have a second species of fox. This species actually can climb trees. Um, they're very cat-like um, and they're very interesting. So we. You get a couple sightings here and there, but like I said, they're pretty rare. They're, they don't like people and they tend to be more nocturnal um, and they live more in dense forests than out in open fields where you see the red fox. So another um, really common call we get and common species that we interact with in our neighborhoods and um, kind of more urban centers are squirrels. Once again, you know, even though it's a squirrel and people think, oh, they're common, I could just take care of them. You know, they should all go to a licensed rehabilitator. Um, a lot of them get knocked down with tree cuttings or in storms. Um, and so we usually just tell people, put them in a box and put them at the base of a tree, even if it's a different tree and um, let the mother retrieve them and they'll tend to, to come back. Well, once you leave and you're not, you're not in the general area, they'll come take them um, back. So a lot of times they don't need to be intervened with um, unless um, you know, a cat has got them or they have actual injuries. We also get a lot of flying squirrels. So, um, uh, they're nests in, in tree cavities, sometimes like bluebird boxes, things like that. We've got them in attics and sheds as well. So once again, people don't even realize we see them. Uh, another one is groundhogs. Um, same thing. Most people find a groundhog. It's that they it's under their shed and they don't want it there. So same thing with the uh, the ammonia tennis ball kind of thing, and just kind of you know. Evicting it from the area is usually the best um, um, the best course of action. Of course, they get hit by cars quite a bit. They hang out by roadsides. So another really big one that we get, uh, I had a couple of these yesterday come in, um, are fawns. Um, so fawns um, have a unique behavior that their mothers um, do with them, which is uh, the mother tends to take care of the fawn. She'll clean it. She'll keep it. Um, it so its scent is um, very reduced, so this doesn't attract predators. And then we'll leave it alone most of the day. So we'll, people will find fawns wandering around or sleeping in their backyards, and they go, oh my gosh, this baby's orphaned. You know, I gotta rescue it, take it somewhere. So um, nine times out of 10, I would say, the mother is there and, um, and usually hang out in the woods somewhere, keeping an eye on the baby, and then we'll come out at dusk or after dark and feed the baby and tend to it. Um, but people find them in you know, situations understandably and think that they're in trouble. Uh, the best way to tell if they're in trouble is if the fawn is crying out um, or it's covered in flies or has feces on its back. That means the mother's not taking care of it. 
and that would be a situation where it would need help. So there's a select few um, rehab um, places that will take fawns so we can help coordinate that potentially if needed or animal control is another great resource for that sometimes. Uh, rabbits are the other one. So a lot of us are mowing our grass right now this time of year, um, every week now. So we're finding these little cottontail um, nests in, um, in backyards. So um, what we tend to do is um, tell people, you know, if you find the nest, you can find out if the mother's coming back to it or not by, um, you know, putting something over like grass or um, strings or putting flour around the nest um, so that you can tell if the mothers come to them. Same thing as deer. People come out um, after dark a lot of times or at dusk and dawn to feed the babies. They might not be there during the day, so you don't. You don't know um, if they're, and people just assume they're orphaned because they don't see the mother, but same situation. So bats, um, you know, we get these in people's houses, unfortunately, sometimes, and um, we we don't typically go into people's houses um, to do any wildlife rescue. If the animal's healthy and just in someone's house, we recommend calling a wildlife uh, control company, which are, you have to pay them, but um, they'll come into your house, they'll help seal up where the animal might have got in, they'll check to see if there's a roost in the attic, that sort of thing. Um, but we can also talk to people about, um, you know, what to do if they do find one in there. Um, but, you know, the big thing is not no skin, human skin touch uh, or contact. And then, uh, you know, don't sleep in a room where there's a bat flying around kind of thing. So we usually say lock off that area of the house and then, um, you know, try to get it out. Um, with a towel, you know, throw a towel around it and then take it outside, and let it go, unless it's injured. So we also get mice and uh, voles and things like that sometimes. So, um, you know, any, any animals that could need help, um, we try to help people out with. And, you know, a lot of the calls are things like, oh my gosh, I saw this animal that only has one foot or it's hopping on one foot. A lot of times, you know, that's just part of nature. There's a lot of animals, turtles, geese, uh, this coyote here that we caught on trail camera just has three legs and that's how it lives and it, it does just fine it hunts it um you know it does everything it needs to do it doesn't need any intervention um it can survive that way uh just fine um you know we also have a lot of calls for things like mange um you know we cannot treat animals for mange um there are med uh, medicines out there that people have used for that um that is not uh, deemed safe because uh, other animals can uh, ingest it potentially in pets. Um, so we typically say if it has mange, unfortunately there's not much we can do. Um, if there's adult rabies vector species like raccoons, unless there, if something has rabies and it's a threat, we could call animal control um, or sheriff's department if there's actually an active threat from that animal. Uh, you know, adult foxes, raccoons, skunks, things like that. Um, the rehabilitators are not allowed to treat them. Uh, same with deer. Uh, it's, just, it's a large, dangerous animal to try to treat and to cage and do all those sorts of things. So uh, a lot of these mammals can't cross state lines. Um, certain fur bearers can't be treated unless they get special permission, that sort of thing. So um, there's a lot that goes into this stuff. Um, every once in a while, we also get uh, these, uh, these unique rescues. Like this is a pool rescue. Um, where we had a, a swimming pool became uncovered over the winter and then it turned into a uh, uh, immense amphibian breeding ground and uh, we actually put in some some things for the animals to get out on their own and we scooped out many salamanders and frogs and toads that were all breeding in this pool um, together um, and you know that's why it's important to cover these pools and over the winter and uh, and but you also see how easy it is to potentially create new habitat. You know, if you create a backyard pond or something like that, you can have a lot of different animals using it rather quickly as we've done at the Wildlife Center. Um, we've also helped with like pond drainings, things like that, where animals are kind of stranded before they start digging out uh, the ponds, um, like for sediments or things like that. So we get a lot of snake calls uh, as well. So snakes get in people's houses. Um, the one on the bottom right is a rattlesnake that we don't have those here in Hartford County, but it's kind of just a joke. Um, Everybody thinks that uh, snakes are hiding out everywhere, ready to get you kind of thing. But the snakes do get in homes sometimes. Uh, we have especially black rat snakes, um, eastern rat snakes that end up in people's basements. i usually attracted to rodents or they're hibernating in there. Um, there's some things we could do to get those out. We could talk you through it. Um, 
Uh, snakes are beneficial to have in the ecosystem. They're also protected by law. You cannot kill a snake in Maryland legally. Um, so we try to get people to leave them alone or to safely remove them from the home and let them go. Um, uh, you know, and one of the big things we try to do is, um, you know, educate people on, you know, how important snakes are and, um, you know, try to help families and kids, you know, to be more understanding of snakes that they really are important and, and interesting and unique species that are important for controlling rodents and insects, um, things like that uh, in our ecosystems. Um, we've gotten many that get stuck in landscape netting and we've had to cut them out um, of, of those situations. Even a copperhead uh, a couple of years ago um, was caught in landscape netting. We had to um, safely cover it up and uh, cut it out to release it. Uh, that stuff's pretty nasty, but we can help with those sorts of things too. Um, and this is something um, that we talk about too, is you know a lot of people just see a snake and they chop its head off with a shovel, which is really horrific. Um, but we, we can tell people if you really want a snake to vacate your, your area, of your yard, um, you can spray it with a hose lightly. Of course, don't blast it with a hose and hurt it, but um, spraying a hose kind of near it, just enough to keep it at a distance and kind of get it to move a different direction is a nice safe way uh, of doing it without having to pick up the snake. Um, most people that get bit by a snake is just because they're picking it up. Uh, even harmless snakes, they'll bite just in defense and they're trying to get away. So if you, if you do those sorts of things, you can make a big difference in, uh, in helping them out uh, safely. Um, any questions or anything uh, right now? Are we doing good still? I know we got about 15 minutes. Yeah, we're doing fine. If anybody has a question, you know, if you want to type it in the chat or unmute yourself real quick, but um, yeah, otherwise I, I don't see anything in the chat. Cool. I'm just, I'm just rolling along here. So <laughs> trying to cover as much as I can. So no problem. If anyone has a question, please jump in. I'm glad to answer it. Um, um, I have a question. When sure. You just uh, when you were just talking about the snakes, um, I have an instance where there's a snake that's found a hole, but he's right near where a car opens. So it's, and he's aggressive as far as keeping his head out and hissing. So I don't know if he has babies in there or what the situation could be. So obviously I don't want to leave him there because I have a little grandson running by all the time and so forth, but I don't want to hurt him. I wondered what you said earlier about putting ammonia on a rag near the hole. Would that cause them to vacate? Not typically for snakes. I mean, and the, the snake repellent they sell, a lot of that stuff's kind of nasty chemicals. I don't like recommending it. A lot of times it kills other things. Um, so, you know, in those situations, so they don't really, they don't raise their babies. They lay eggs or they give live birth and they leave them. Um, you know, they might hang out in the same basking area for a little bit but they don't tend to really protect the babies. So if it's under there, it's just using it as a, um, as a hiding place. So the best thing that pe most people do in those situations is try to wait till it's out. Like if it's out basket, it's probably a garter snake is my guess. That's typically what's hanging out under porches and things like that. Um, kind of like grayish brown with yellow stripes or checkers on it. Does that sound right? Um, grayish brown. I've only seen the top because it comes out and okay. not hisses, but open its mouth. It's kind of aggressive. Okay. So we typically say um, that they're mostly defensive. So they're they're trying to protect themselves, and they're they're in a situation where they feel threatened in some way. But it should come out at some point. Um, and what I would say is, if it does come out, that would be a good situation. Then hurry up and seal up the hole that it's getting into. Um, you know, that's what most people do is just wait till it vacates out of there and then try to seal the hole up. Um, you know, like I said, it's not in there protecting babies, just using it as a hiding place. So okay. they like to have cover. So unfortunately, it's not a great solution there. But as far as I know, there's nothing really you can put in there that's going to like make it want to leave per se. Um, okay. You don't want to you don't want to seal it up while it's in there, though, of course, because it'll just get well, stuck. Well, yeah, that's what I was wondering. Yeah. So sealing it up, unless you... <laughs> For sure, it's not in there. That's was I was a little bit hesitant because yeah. sometimes its head's you know like about four inches out. It hangs out with part of its head out. Mm -hmm. But other times, if you don't see it, I don't know if it's in there or not. But okay, thank you very much. And no problem. And it would probably come out in the morning more when it's, it's really hot. It's like they're going to probably be in the shade more. But when it, you know, first sun in the morning when it's getting it's just starting to heat up, they might come out and bask. Um, okay. So just keep an eye out for it. Yeah. All right, thank you. No problem.
Um, so turtles. So we do a lot of research and advocacy around turtles because we have quite a bit of diversity here in this area, but also there's some of our most imperiled species um, in, in this region. So we have some pretty rare and declining species um, for a number of reasons um, we'll get into really quick here. So um, here's the, some of the threats to turtles that we've been dealing with and advocating uh, for. Um, you know, roads, we all know um, that's a big um, effect on turtles, um, but uh, we have things like ranavirus, which is this disease that infects these turtles. Um, uh, rather quickly and can spread through them. Uh, injury like fishing hooks and things like that does happen sometimes or lawnmower strikes. Um, but one of the big things too is um, collection for the pet trade. So we'll actually keep turtle locations um, confidential for that reason because um, some of these species are, are collected and sold illegally uh, across seas and uh, internationally and smuggled and things like that because they have a value overseas. Uh, and they're protected in Maryland, you know, from selling any of our native species um, that are caught in the wild, but um, it still occurs sometimes. In some places, you know, we have very sensitive rare species that we know about, and, you know, we don't want people coming in there and taking them and trying to sell them and, and destroying that population. We also have to deal with nest predation. So um, raccoons, things like foxes, skunks, uh, will dig up turtle nests and, and eat almost every single egg in the nest. And you know, every time that happens, you know, that's a whole um, generation of turtles that might not make it um, to replace their parents. And the good thing about turtles, they live a long time. Most of them, some of like box turtles could live you know, 90, 100 years in some cases. So that's a long time to lay a lot of eggs. But if every year they're getting eaten or they get hit by a car on the road or they get collected um, into the pet trade, you know, that turtle can no longer lay eggs. So that whole um, influence on the population is then gone. Um, that's where that slide went I was looking for. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, one of the things that we talk about is, you know, if we see a turtle on the road, helping it cross in the direction that it's heading in, that's a very important, um, uh, easy thing to remember is if, you know, turtles walking in one direction, help it go that direction because it knows where it wants to go for whatever reason. Um, and you can help it kind of go, go in that direction and get, um, across the road where it's got a lot of dangers. Um, things like snapping turtles require a little bit extra care. They, they snap and they very strong jaws, it can be dangerous. Um, holding them from the back of the shell uh, around the area of their legs. Um, and then, you know, or putting your hand underneath the belly once you got it um, secured. Um, but a lot of people that aren't comfortable doing that will put them either in, in a container, push them into a container, or um, you can put them onto a uh, car mat um, just lift them up a little bit on the car mat and then drag them backwards on a car mat across the road, um, or a shovel, things like that. So um, there's a bunch of different ways to do it safely. Um, do not pick them up by their tail, as you might see a lot of people doing on the internet or on Facebook. Um, it can actually harm them. It causes a lot of strain uh, to their bodies and their spine. Um, but you can also see here, um, you know, a lot of places like a vacation place like Myrtle Beach, um, some of these like different festivals, things like that will sell baby turtles. Uh, it used to be very common to see baby turtles at like places like Woolworths and things like that back in the 70s. Um, it's been made illegal to sell baby turtles in Maryland under four inches um, because a lot of times they end up being these throwaway pets like goldfish where people get them and they don't really uh, understand the amount of care that they require. So these turtles can live, you know, 50, 60 years. They can require 75 or 100 gallon aquarium for full-grown females some of these species uh, they require special lighting and food and and filtration it's a lot of work you know and a lot of people will get these turtles and they're little cute green um you know half dollar size turtles and then they get really big um, pretty quick and then people just go and dump them out into the ecosystem so we have a lot of species that we find like red-eared sliders sometimes like soft shell turtles things like that that are actually not native to this area that are well established and breeding uh, and taking over habitat and food that our native species need because people didn't want their pets and they decided to let them go. Um, so that's a big problem that we're also dealing with. Um, so always a little bit of a joke here, but um, well, some people think turtles can leave their shells, but that's why their shells are so important um, and why getting hit by a car is so um, disastrous for turtles is their shell is actually part of their body. Um, so, um, you know, you see pictures here of these people holding turtles improperly and, and being very unsafe with them and getting bitten and things like that. So 
um, you know, these are these are animals that uh, you know need to be treated with uh, great care and caution. Um, and you can see the different way of holding them compared to those other guys. So, so uh, as we get towards the close here, I just wanted to kind of go through some of our partners. Um, um, yeah, we work closely with Chattel Animal Hospital. It's a great vet hospital in the area that does some pro bono wildlife work. You know, we always encourage people to still give them um, donations when possible for that kind of stuff because it is expensive to care for wildlife and they're 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 running a business at the same time. So we appreciate them. And um, we have Tiny Treasures Wildlife Rehab in this area that's doing a great job for mostly small mammals and Wildlife Rescue Inks in Baltimore County as well as Phoenix. We we rely on heavily for especially birds of prey and things like that, as well as like Almond Raptor Center down in Southern Maryland, or uh, Montgomery County rather. Um, and then Tri-State is over the line in Delaware. Um, they do a lot of work with um, raptors and things like that. Um, Lights Out Baltimore is in Baltimore City. And then we use people like Mid-Atlantic Wildlife Control and um, Critter Cop uh, or, or for-profit uh, paid wildlife control companies that you can call. And then Frisky is over in Howard County. So we have all these on our website. So if you're in need quickly, um, and we try to lay them out and see who, who kind of does what, who's in the area that might be able to help. So also um, there's some government resources. So, um, uh, and this might vary. So, uh, you know, please forgive me if these are, these times or anything are off, but Harford County Animal Control is a wonderful partner and they often will be able to help with wildlife issues too. And they'll connect with one of the rehabilitators um, or, or vet hospitals if they do pick up wildlife that is in need. Um, their hours are somewhat limited, so later at night, things like that, um, you know, sometimes we can um, we can try to help um, help out with those things as well um, if they're not available or you need another resource. Um, and then DNR has a limited um, crew, but they will help out with some of these wildlife issues as well if you call their hotline. So here's a couple um, events we have coming up. Um, for y'all, and uh, we'll have more announced for the summer as well. We're going to be filling in some different um, spots with some different events. But uh, the big next thing that we have coming up is um, our firefly hike and campfire, and that's on July 11th, and that is going to be at the Wildlife Center. At night and watch all the fireflies and listen for owls, and then we um, we have s'mores at the end, kind of talk around the campfire. Um, and then we are having our pawpaw celebration, which is a native fruit. Uh, we have uh, we partner with Brooms Bloom Dairy, and we do that in September uh, 24th this year. And we have lemonade and um, and all sorts of cool pawpaw products. It's uh, a native plant that hosts the zebra swallowtail butterfly, and it grows natively um, in our watershed. So it's a really cool celebration for that. Uh, and then we try to squeeze in some creek snorkeling. We just did a kayak trip last week. Um, we might do some more movie nights and some talks in our barn. So we're looking forward to some of that with you all um, coming up soon. And then we have some library talks that have just been announced as well with the Harvard County Public Libraries. And then here out on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and all those fun places, um, as well as uh, YouTube. We have some videos up there of different wildlife. Um, species that we find in different rescues as well as uh, how to make a, a meadow in your in your yard and how important uh, creating pollinator habitat is for our area so um i'll leave you with that and then any questions i'm glad to answer we have just a couple minutes i think um hopefully i didn't go too fast but i tried to cover a lot in a small time yes thank you scott that was wonderful I always learn something different when uh, when you present. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, putting the I think I have to share that thing about putting the yarn across the um, the rabbit nest or um, flower around the like kind of where the nest is. That was interesting. Yeah, I've I, I've been done it myself. The only thing about the flower that's been said a lot. The flower is good because you see their footprints in it or the mm -hmm. disturbance. But I think flower can sometimes attract other animals. So I think. I think yeah. the yarn, you know, some people use little sticks. That's kind of the more natural way or like grass. You know, if you make the grass look like, you know, like a little tic-tac-toe board, um, that way you're not putting something there that might bring scent to that. But but the flowers commonly said, I, I just kind of share that because it's 
that's what kind of people say all the time. But I, I think, you know, keeping human scent away from, you know, babies is really important because okay. a lot of predators, you know, they, they smell humans and they know there's food nearby. So. Right. Okay. Yeah. That was interesting. All right. Do we have any any questions? I mean, if anybody wants to unmute, um, you know, go for it. Um, otherwise, uh, we can go ahead and wrap things up. Anyone? No questions here, but thank you. That was very informative. No, my pleasure. Thanks for joining us. All right. So with that, um, thank you so much, Scott. My um, pleasure. Have a great really day. Really appreciated it. And uh, we will be posting this on our website uh, by the end of today um, for playback. So, uh, you know, if you want to share that uh, sure. and we'll post the link on our social media so people can watch. Great. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.